Hi Spring fans, welcome to another installment of Spring Tips. You know, I'm a big fan of things that make me more secure. Obviously, I love Spring Security. It's a great framework for easily taking an existing application, adding some security, and letting me get on with the business of delivering valuable software to my users, unencumbered by the concerns of security. I don't want to worry about it. I just want the framework to do a good job. It gives me endless comfort to know that there's a whole team working on Spring Security that care very much about making sure that your application is secure. It's what they think about all day. And one of the things that's a very useful thing to think about in the world of building software that I think rather intersects with that world is user management. Who are your users? Where do they come from? How do you find them? How do you locate them? How do they authenticate? How do you know that they're real? So the other thing is how do you integrate that identity manager, that identity provider, that IDP into your application workflow, especially if you have multiple microservices. So a very useful t protocol, of course, is OAuth. And you've heard me talk about OAuth over the years, many different ways, many different times. Um, and, and in particular, we've also looked more recently at the Spring Authorization Server. We did, I did a three-part series even on the Spring Authorization Server. The Spring Authorization Server is a IDP. It provides easy access to the ability to do delegated authentication, right? So basically it's OAuth itself, the protocol, the whole point of that is to give the driver of an API the ability to act on your behalf. And they do that with a token. The first thing that a lot of these drivers tend to do is they log in to, let's say, Google or Facebook or GitHub or whatever on your behalf. And the first thing they would do as an OAuth client is then ask OAuth, uh, sorry, ask GitHub or ask LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever for information about you because they wanted to establish an identity for their own database, right? Well, that becomes such a common use case that they even created a, a new standard on top of OAuth 2 called OIDC or, or OpenID Connect. And this protocol, standardizes a simple HTTP endpoint that gives the OAuth user, the OAuth client, information about who, on whose behalf they're making these requests. So this is very convenient. So imagine you go to, you know, some website like the your local town's newspaper. They have a login with Facebook or login with Google. You click on that, it redirects you to google.com or to facebook.com. They've got a team of people making sure that you have, you know, that they, they, they have valid data about you, right? Some of these social networks even ask for your driver's license. And so there, they have a, you know, a much better handle on who you are, or at least it's good enough to start with, certainly, so that you can go there, do the OAuth flow, you get redirected back to the OAuth client. The OAuth client now has a token. They can then hit that standardized user info endpoint to get information about you and establish an identity and act on your behalf with that token and with that knowledge of who you are. They can say hello and then the username, right? This is a very useful capability. And we talked about how to set this up with the authorization server. I love the authorization server. Uh, it supports pure play OIDC. And uh, Spring Security's OAuth support supports OpenID Connect, OIDC as well. So it's very easy to get these things working. In theory, you should be able to work with Spring Security and any other OAuth provider or any OpenID provider as well. But I'm here to tell you, it's not always so easy. So today we're gonna sort of take a look at, it was not too bad once I got it figured out, but it just wasn't clear how to get it figured out. So today we're gonna take a look at the rocky but worthwhile journey to Auth0. Now, Auth0, my friends, is a OpenID compliant directory services, an identity provider. They do all sorts of stuff around identity management, but your interface to it is, as often as not, is gonna be in terms of Open, OpenID Connect or OAuth. So it acts like the Spring Authorization Server does in this case, it, you know, in your architecture. It is a thing that handles validating who the user is and establishing an identity for you and then giving you back a token that you can use. Uh, you can also store users in that database of theirs. You can write it to that and, and query it. You can, you can do all sorts of cool things there. They even have plugins that go beyond just logging in and authentication. Uh, for example, they can, there are plugins from third-party providers that are integrated. There's a dashboard you can just add in and add that to your billing. And by the way, this is usually not, you know, you can start, there's a generous free tier as I understand it, but all zero is not free, right? But with this, you get some nice extensions, one of which I noticed is, let's suppose you have a, a requirement to avoid certain countries due to sanctions. This is actually a thing that people here in the United States need to care about, right? I, we can't do business with certain countries that have been sanctioned by the US government. I think that's pretty true for many countries, right, that are uh, uh, partners of the United States. They can't do business with 
countries that the United States have sanctioned as well. So it's very important. It's incumbent upon every U.S. citizen when they stand up an internet portal to make sure that they're not taking, you know, new accounts from jurisdictions where they have no earthly ability to do business there in the first place, lest they should be in real trouble with the law. So there's plugins like that. You can, you can avoid sanctioned countries, for example. You know, just very cool stuff like that. I, I don't want to think about that. I need to think about it. It's part of the part, it's part and parcel of being on the internet, but it's also something you got to be like aware of. And it's nice to have plugins backed by teams of people that have a vested interest in doing a good job here. So today we're going to take a look at Auth0. I'm not going to set up everything, but you know, we're going to try it out and we're going to do it as always by going to Well, not start.spring.io today. We're going to start at auth0.com here. I'm going to log in. And what I love about this is if you go to auth0, you can see that this, this login page briefly takes you to auth0.auth0.com. That is to say, their tenant ID or their you know the name of their subdomain is auth0, which is where you log in when you want to get to, yes, auth0. <laughs> So, okay, I've got an account here. Uh, I just set this up. I haven't, I'm not paying for it. I've got the free tier at the moment. You can see there's nice features here. You can add users and team members, try to customize your login box, add actions, all that kind of stuff. What I'm going to do for you know our purposes, I'm going to create an application. Uh, and I've got an application here called Bootyful. And I didn't do anything too special. I've got a domain, I've got a client ID and a client secret. I've got the name of the app, which is Bootyful, it's fine. And uh, I've got a logo, I didn't, this is the default, no problem. I specified regular web application. Uh, and then the only other thing that I did was I specified a callback URL. This URL is in the form of the Open ID Connect uh, uh, callback endpoint that Spring Security provides by default. So you can, you know, obviously you can customize this, but by default, if you're using Spring Security's OAuth client support, it's gonna read, it's gonna tell the OAuth IDP that once you have been authorized and ostensibly authenticated, it should redirect back to this endpoint in the OAuth client, our Spring Boot application. Um, and so we're, we're telling the IDP here what, what endpoint that is. Otherwise, it's just stock standard stuff. I think I just left all the defaults there. There's really interesting stuff here, but let's just get started with that. So now we'll go to start.spring.io. I'm gonna build a, a client, okay? This is gonna be an OAuth2 client. I'll be using the reactive web support and I'm gonna be using the reactive gateway support. I just act accidentally added the uh, regular gateway. Let me get rid of that. I'm gonna use the reactive gateway and the OAuth2 client and the Spring reactive web support. And I'm gonna call this client, All right? Hit enter and open this up in our ID. Here we go, client.zip. All right, here's our client application. All right, and uh, let's just start simple, All right? At controller, response body, class, simple, or, you know, greetings controller, yeah? And we're gonna say that when somebody goes to forward slash hello, we return a message, okay? I'm gonna return the message based on the currently authenticated principle, like that, map type of message, hello principle dot get name, okay? Now, in order for this to work, you know, right now we've got a simple client application and there is no, you know, we haven't configured security. So if we tried to make it a call to this endpoint, it'll just get rejected. Localhost 8080, hello. Okay, it's asking me to do a login. I don't wanna do a login, I wanna do OAuth. So let's configure an OAuth client. Basically, we need to tell our application about Auth0. So I'll create a new registration here. Client.auth0.provider is Auth0. And the redirector URI, is a special URI. And this is just a convention that we'll use. We're also gonna provide a scope. Remember, we wanna do open ID. This is the minimal scope that we want. This is an OAuth, this is an OAuth scope, but we want open ID. You can add others, but we want that one. We want a client ID, which I've, I've taken those values that I saw on the console there, and I've exported them as environment variables. So client secret auth, zero client secret and authorization grant met type will be authorization code and we want the client authentic authentication method will be client secret basic 
And then finally, we need to register a little bit about the provider itself. So let's say OAuth to client provider auth zero dot issuer I will be auth zero domain. Okay, yet another environment variable that I've registered there. All right, so let's now restart. I go to the browser, localhost 8080 forward slash hello. Okay, so you can see I've already been forced to log in before. So let me clear my browser tab, my history. Okay, now I go to hello again. And now it's saying, hey, you want to log in, continue with Google. Yes, I do. Choose this one, no problem. Okay, it's asking me to validate who I am. Okay, so you can see I had to do the whole OAuth, you know, I had to do the whole login thing in Google's portal, in Google's website on their domain. And then finally I got redirected back to the application where I was able to then establish an identity and I got a username from Google. It's Google OAuth Pike and then the ID, right? And so if you did GitHub, you get GitHub Pike and then some other ID and Facebook Pike, some other ID. So there's, you know, it's a start, right? At least I have a now I now have a way to tie what user this is and what identity they, are, they have. Very good. So this is already pretty good. We've already got some, you know, we've already made some good progress here. What I want to do now is to take that ID, that token, and then use it to make another request, forward it on to the downstream microservice. And, and then that downstream microservice will act as a resource server, right? That is to say, it'll take the token, ask the IDP, the issuer of that token, which is in this case is off zero, to validate that token. Uh, and if it's valid, it'll say, okay, I'll allow the request. So it's not gonna it's not gonna redo the redirect and force the user to log in, but it will it will send the user away if there's no token. So it's gonna protect itself at least. The, the problem is that token won't be readable as it is by default. We need to tell the client our code right now to automatically add an audience value to the request before it goes out. And so this gets us to a nice bit of code that I found thanks to our friend, the one, the only, the amazing Matt Rabel, friend of the show, friend of the community. So here's the code. So basically I got this from a GitHub issue to which he responded some time ago. And it's, you know, it's, it, it's overriding the default filter configuration for the security web filter chain that Spring Security uses in the client. We're, you know, we're doing OAuth2 login again. We're just overriding the defaults there, providing an authorization request resolver. This authorization request resolver, we configure here to have an audience. And this audience is a value that we get from auth0.audience. So let's go ahead and specify that in our property file. auth0.audience equals auth0.domain forward slash API forward slash v2. Okay, and that should be it. So let's go ahead and restart this code, make sure it still works. And then if it does, we'll then convert it to a gateway, which will proxy. Seems fine, good. Now let's go back to start.spring.io and I'm not gonna use an OAuth client or the reactive anything. I'm just gonna use the regular web stuff and I'll use the resource server support. And we're gonna call this API, hit refresh. And this API, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna take the code from the existing one, cut that, paste that here, and we'll add an, an issuer URI. Resource server issuer URI equals zero domain. Okay, that'll give the API everything it needs to figure out how to validate the token should it encounter one. So now let's create a reactive Spring Cloud Gateway gateway. We need to, in the build, make sure you have Spring Cloud Gateway. Okay, and now let's go back and make sure we have a valid Spring Cloud Gateway in the client. Okay, we're gonna specify some routes, just one in this case, rs.uri forward slash asterisk. I'm gonna send it, actually it's a path, we're gonna match the incoming path to forward slash asterisk and send it onward to that localhost 8080 Okay, actually the port that we are gonna use over here on the API should be something else, surely. So port, let's make it 9090 and then restart. Okay, now we go back to here, specify 9090. And the filter that happens in between the request being matched and it being proxied onward is the token relay. So filters FS token relay. That's going to take the current request grab the current authenticated principle, get the token, and then encode it in the request headers for the outgoing request downward, uh, onward to the localhost 9090. Okay, so very simple. You could do, you know, all sorts of things here. And the nice thing about this pattern is that, you know, you could have actually a prefix. You could do like forward slash API for all the API endpoints and then have another route that proxies your Angular, React, Vue, 
CDN hosted thing as well. And so now all those requests would be behind this authentication. So you hit this endpoint, it does security, and then it sends it onward. Okay, so we've got our gateway. Let's go ahead and refresh or restart this. Okay, well now we go to localhost, go to localhost hello again. And this time, you can see it's actually got the same result, but the result is coming from here. So let's prove that by adding this logging and then restart the API, refresh, and you can see hello from the API. So now we've been able to secure both our front end and the microservices in the back end, all pretty conveniently using just stock standard spring security and just a, a slight override of some of the default configuration here. Not bad at all, very easy to do, very, very straightforward. All in all, I found this exercise to be quite satisfying because it's just an example of how powerful a spring security is. It's trivial to defend a fleet of services with almost no configuration at all. In fact, if you wanted to, you could actually start putting this stuff in the Spring Cloud config server and they could all benefit. You could have the same exact issuer URI definition in the config server and then just point all of your microservices to that same configuration. Now you've got a hundred different microservices all you know secured, right? No big deal. And of course, you're probably just gonna have one ingress into the cluster, one, one gateway somewhere, and that'll be an OAuth client as we've demonstrated here. Auth0 seems pretty powerful. I am glad we got to have this conversation and kind of look at how to use it because it was confusing trying to figure out what to do, right? Because there's a there's a starter for Okta that some documentation points to, but it itself used to work with Okta, but now it works with Auth0, Auth but it doesn't work unless you do this if you're trying to do the resource server thing. And then also, how do you do it with just regular stock standard spring security? And also you can't use Okta anymore. At least I don't think you can. I couldn't figure out how to get an account there. So it was just a lot of like, moving parts. I get it. Things happen. But this is it was just really nice to be able to put this all together and see it work end to end. I hope you got something out of it. Hope you are all the more interested and, and eager to secure your systems and software. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.